Welcome to Friday Live with Byline Times. I am Hardeep Matharu. I'm the editor of Byline Times, and I'm joined by Adam Bienkoff, our political editor, and Josiah Mortimer, our chief reporter. Over the next hour, we will be dissecting the developments in the second week of riots, which are sweeping across England. Then we'll be going across the Atlantic and looking at perhaps more positive developments in the US, uh, a right turnaround in a matter of weeks. Adam, do you want to kick off with what are the latest, most pertinent developments in this quite fast moving story in some ways about what is being billed the race rights of 2024? Yeah, so as you say, we're into the second week of these riots, which I th in, the, in and of itself is, is notable. I mean, looking back to the 2011 riots, they only lasted, I think, the best part of a week. Uh, we're now into second week. It doesn't seem to be dying down. I think what's different from the 2011 riots is there seems to be a greater level of coordination. Mm -hmm. And also, I think social media has played a much bigger role. So people are streaming these their activities live on TikTok, particularly, um, which on the one hand, is, is, is encouraging a lot more people to get involved. So we're seeing larger numbers getting involved in these rights. But also it's leading to people being much easier to be identified by the police. So we've already seen some rapid, um, seeing some of the first charges coming through of some of the perpetrators of these these riots, rapid justice being being doled out upon them, which, which is definitely a positive development. But as I say, it doesn't look like things are dying down particularly. And there have been reports uh, today about some some more targeted attacks coming coming up in the in the in the coming days, including against legal professionals, people involved in immigration law, representing immigration cases, particularly worrying in that respect as well. Um, but as I say, we will have to wait and see see how that plays out over the coming days. It's really striking. I remember just it must be just three weeks ago, just before. I think Byline Festival had a stay, had a uh, presence at WOMAD Festival, and the night before we were talking, weren't we, Adam, about mm. the 2011 London riots? Yes. And we were. It's exactly what we were saying. We were saying how interesting it was that that the, how significant they were, and how s little they are talked about now, or any yeah. sense of learning from what exactly was going on, or any real dissection of it. What do you think is different from what was going on then and what's going on now? Because what I mean, the riot after the, in, the the killings in Southport very much started as the reporting around them was that they're riots, these are protesters, and now it, it, quite definitively they're being called race riots, the far right mm. extremism. What do you what? But what's sort of the difference? Do you think? And I mean, is yeah, there any an relation? It's between... an interesting question because there was, a, of course, a racial element to the twenty. Um, 11 riots, uh, the killing of uh, Mark Duggan. Um, but it was never really talked about in the same way in, in those terms. I mean, obviously, there are there are big differences, um, particularly in how this all started. Um, the, the the killings in, in Southport, the the misidentification, the mis disinformation that was spread. And the fact, I think, what happened in the London riots and the other riots around uh, the country in 2011... They, they involved members of the public, but they, they didn't really have a political edge in the mm. way that these riots do. So the involvement of people like Nigel Farage, uh, his comments that he made in the in the aftermath of the, the Southport killings, suggesting that the, the truth was being withheld from people, playing into conspiracy theories about them being perpetrated by um, a Muslim individual and this being covered up by the state. That That's a real difference mm. um that, and the, the involvement of figures like elon musk as well which which has taken it to a it's extraordinary turn it into a global story um and his, his engagement with keir starmer so it's a much more i think it's been much more politicized than the 2011 riots which i think at the time was much more perceived as just a kind of law and order issue mm. whereas this is is very much about politics it's about race we've we've had this entire debate about 
two-tier policing, which is now sort of being talked about even in the press as if it's a real thing, um, when actually all of the evidence shows that if there is two-tier policing, it's in the other direction. You know, mm. um, criminal uh, crim- people of colour who commit crimes are much... Are actually, sniff- multiple studies have shown are, m- are much more likely to, to be both arrested and to be convicted, um, to be charged and convicted than, than, than white criminals. Um, and so that I think that is the real the real big difference, that kind of political edge to, to these riots mm. that we didn't really see in 2011. Mm. And Josiah, do you think it's striking that these riots have come so quickly after the Labour landslide in the general election? I mean, I mean, there's been a lot of commentary about the riots. Again, I would question how deep that it, that goes and whether the commentators are talking enough about the political climate and how we reach this point. But... Some have some have suggested that actually this is less about uh, race, although it is absolutely the case that uh, some of the rioters will be far right extremists, and this is much more perhaps a coordinated effort to, in some way, undermine the Labour leadership and from the beginning uh, put the government on the back foot. I mean, yeah, are, yeah. are you struck by? how different the tone is just a few weeks on from the election. It's definitely a change of tone. Um, and I think one thing I've been uh, enjoying doing, maybe enjoying is not the right word, uh, this week is rummaging through lots of um, Facebook groups from you know some, some organisations that support these, uh, these riots, but also Reform UK supporters groups. And the themes that come up are pretty um pretty common and and there's a lot of repetition and some of that is blaming the riots on Keir Starmer um saying you know Keir Starmer should resign over this so it's it's gone very quickly to a Keir Starmer must go because of these riots and you know others are spreading conspiracy theories so saying that the riots are apparently being coordinated by 93 year old George Soros um the US Jewish billionaire um and and others that just uh, basically deny that, that there's a real problem and say that it's actually uh, you know Muslims who are causing most of the violence. So um, there's a lot of what you might call sort of far right cope going on, um, either sort of denying that the, that the riots are really as serious as as it appears they are, um, or suggesting sort of there's up there's underhand things going on. Um, but it does seem to have that political dimension that that mm. you're suggesting. Um, I think. I mean, you know, Adam touched on the sort of um, connections with political figures. I mean, you know, you've seen people like Tommy Robinson um, who have been allowed back on platforms like X, you know, under under Elon Musk. And I think that's that's played into this problem quite a lot. Mm. Um, you know, whereas previously you'd be getting, you know, maybe hundreds of views on a Telegram channel. People like him are now able to get millions of views and it's being promoted by the X or Twitter algorithm. So I think that's definitely made a difference. Um, they are now emboldened by, um, you know, some US actors, you know, people like Elon Musk who are stepping into these um, domestic debates and, and you know, Elon Musk, for example, saying that civil war is inevitable mm. in the UK, a country that he has, you know, it seems to have no no idea about really. Um, part of me thinks that he's, he's whipping up these claims that he, he has an excuse to go to his... Um, his sort of bunker that he's built on a foreign island, one of these prepper islands um, that these brolligarchs seem to be so fond of. But um, yeah, it's a very strange, very rapidly changing situation. I mean, some people have been calling for, you know, for example, that groups like the English Defence League to be banned. Um, I think that kind of misses the point. I mean, specifically on the EDL, for example, mm. um, I mean, that stopped existing about 10, 10 years ago. Actually, it's now more individual actors who, like Adam says, are, you know, individual content creators basically capitalizing at this on platforms like TikTok and Telegram. Hmm. And they believe in, in certain ideas. So a lot of hmm. what we're talking about is actually based on, around this far right idea of the sort of great replacement. And that's what that's what that's what Musk is talking about when he's talking about civil war. Hmm. That's why there are these attempts to tie Keir Starman, a new Labour government, to this. Because this idea that the left is trying to replace the white population and this is leading to crimes and to attacks on white people. And that's why there's an attempt to misidentify the killings in, in Southport. And we, we saw it into the run-up to the election. We, we reported on the, some of the, the sort of racist memes that were pushed out by GB News presenter Darren Grimes um, using 
uh, artificial intelligence generated images to paint Keir Starmer surrounded by Muslims uh, wearing a burqa himself. And so this uh, this idea of trying to tie the Labour Party and the, le- and the broader global left mm. to, to Muslims, to an attempt to replace white people with Muslim people and brown, brown people. And so that's, that's kind of the, the idea that a lot of this is based on, as, as Josiah says, not necessarily around individual groups like the EDL, but this kind of sort of global sort of far right ideas mm. that we're seeing sort of played out on social media and also now on the streets. And then all the conspiracy theorist elements all tie into it as well. And yeah. so a lot of people who may not be writing but are on social media and seeing these uh, messages being put out, uh, potentially many more people getting drawn in. But I mean, I want to talk a little bit about how it's being reported on and and what the balance is to be struck because you know on one hand we know that stories become stories and lead the agenda of what is current affairs in this country based on the prominence that they are given so while this does seem to be you know, a very important development. I mean, people are out on the streets, there's violence, hundreds of arrests have been made. It is still a minority of people. It is still a minority of people. Social media seems to be playing a huge role in it. It's not, it does not seem to be the case that, you know, in real life, uh, people are holding meetings in town halls all across the country right now uh, who have concerns about the great replacement theory. So I guess what I'm getting at is how do we look at this balance that the media has to strike? And I I guess I mean, you know, broadcasters with responsibility such as the BBC, there's other standards we sort of expect of the the right-leaning tabloid press. But is there an extent to which two things at once are true, that it's both the case that this is a really concerning development and it sort of brings to light all sorts of things, uh, structural underlying issues that we've been talking about for years on Byline Times, but also that this is a minority of people and, and there isn't a civil war. And no. it's important. And we've just had a Labour landslide being elected in, in this country. And, and I mean, you, I mean, you're absolutely right. It is a minority of people. And there has been some sort of quite extensive polling out in the last week showing quite how much of a minority that mm. worldview is. And there is very little sympathy for the kind of position that Nigel Farage uh, has been putting out about this, about two-tier policing and and and, um, and and the riots, and so it is definitely a minority issue. However, it's, I think I think it's understandable the scale of the the coverage, the fact that we are seeing hotels being burnt down with racial epithets sort of daubed on the walls, uh, bricks thrown at mosques. I think the sort of the broader question is what role the media has had in in getting us to this point, and the the kind of the two-tier approach that has been taken to the extremism on the right mm. as opposed to extremism elsewhere. I mean, if, if you just look at what Nigel Farage has done, if you can if you can kind of sort of do a thought experiment, imagine there was a, a, a British Muslim politician who had their own TV station and was and uh, putting out conspiracy theories about, um, uh, you know, white Christians, for instance, you know, and then this led to, led to riots, and we we wouldn't see that that there would be call for that individual to be uh, arrested. There would be calls for the, the organisation they represented to be prescribed. But instead, we have Nigel Farage on the front cover of the Daily Express today, issuing a warning to the government, saying essentially, "Do as I say, otherwise we're going to see more violence on the streets." And this is this is part of a sort of long sort of mainstreaming of these kind of extreme right views personified by Nigel Farage himself that has never really been challenged and there has been this kind of two-tier approach to where certain forms of extremism I think have been particularly on the right have been tolerated in the UK for far far too long and we've seen the result of that on the streets. It's interesting because I wrote an editorial for Byline Times I think just four days before the election when the Channel 4 investigation came out about the Reform Party activists and one of whom was filmed calling Rishi Sunak the p-word And I warned in that editorial, like you're saying, Adam, that Farage isn't good copy. He's not the man down the pub with a few colourful quotes for the media. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is terrifying for people of colour, but I'm sure many people, that, you know, these sort of activists are saying these things about, you know, who's then the prime minister. And that actually the media needs to wake up because this sort of, the path where this goes is potentially 
quite dangerous. I, I, I mean, it's easy, and it's easy to focus on Farage, and we've talked about him a lot so far, and even sort of Tommy Robinson. But really, these are kind of fringe figures. I think we need to look a bit sort of closer to the centre of, of power. We, we've had quite recently a prime minister in Boris Johnson who previously compared women, Muslim women, to uh, wearing burqas to letterboxes, who said that Islamophobia was a natural reaction to the, to the religion of Islam, who has called um, black Africans pickaninnies. Mm. And again, this has been, toler- not only has this been tolerated, I think in some respects it's been celebrated. He was allowed to get right to the to the highest position in power. We, we have, you know, and there's a lot of talk about social media, about the social me- the role of social media in, in these, these riots. Um, there's been a long, long history of incredibly inflammatory front pages on the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, and elsewhere about British Muslims, about people of colour, about immigrants, about asylum seekers. And that has undoubtedly played a massive role, arguably a much bigger role in the, the position we're now finding ourselves in than a handful of people sending out a handful of tweets with very few followers. Mm. And, and even after the riots have begun, you have front pages like uh, from The Telegraph saying, you know, far right and Muslims clash, mm. as if this was sort of, you know, some... Uh, battle of equals as opposed to mosques literally being attacked in in broad daylight um you know it, it suggests that there's an equ- equivalence there um between the far right sort of targeting muslim communities and i think we should be honest about the fact that um almost all of this is is aimed at is aimed at muslims really and obviously that affects you know um brown people and you know um uh, of, of many religions as well you know they're not um not necessarily particularly intelligent in their targeting but it is i think these are islamophobic riots um and the fact that they've tried to um suggest that the southport killer you know was was a was a muslim who was an asylum seeker without any basis in fact and then gone on to target moss it's almost like they were looking for an excuse yeah it wasn't an accident it was it was by design yeah exactly Mm. um but you know many of these um many of the adverts for these protests uh, have slogans like stop the boats on there mm. which is obviously a slogan of, of the last government and you know when you w- when a government has as its mission stop the boats um and, and it talks no- about invasion on our southern coast and all mm. of this kind of language talks about invasion um you know and and then i think and then fails to solve that problem that it's mm. that it's then whipped up and that right-wing media allies have whipped up then you know, is it any wonder that we see these disgusting mm. sites, which are you know completely unjustifiable? But then you have the, you know, the sort of cheek of um, right wing outlets to say, you know, this is all on all on the social media firms. As, as Adam said, you know, they they have a role to play in this mm. as well. And and what do we have senior conservative politicians emphasising this week? We have Robert Jemrick, who is one of the favourites for the new conservative leadership. His call is for um, people who shout Alu Akbar in the street to be immediately arrested even though the it literally just means God is God is great. But the emphasis is, is again, it's, it's, as you say, it's trying to draw that false equivalence between uh, the people that are being attacked um, and the people who are attacking mm. them. I think what's really striking is it seems as if this could potentially be a moment. I mean, there's a lot of commentators on social media uh you know, sharing images of all these front pages and saying, I wonder how we got here, Mm. you know, looking at that wider question about the political climate. But for me, the real problem is those voices weren't prominent enough or widespread enough when the political climate was being toxified, right? It's it's sort of now as the hotels are burning after the event, people are saying, oh God, that's, that was really everything since the Brexit referendum, if not before, um, that, that has all, all led us here, yeah. you know, and it seems a little bit uh, too little, too too late, to be honest. But I mean, we also had Suella Braverman, Home Secretary, who was advancing theories about Muslim grooming gangs and how most on street child sexual abuse in this country is perpetrated by that demographic of people. Rishi Sunak was prime minister when he did not condemn as Islamophobic Lee Anderson's comments, suggesting that the Muslim mm. Labour mayor of London was handing the city to Islamists. Then there are a few policy sort of developments as well. I mean, we had the review into the prevent strategy, which sure, is, review, yeah. is a controversial counterterrorism uh, program as it is. Uh, not sort of trusted by people in the Muslim community, which suggested that the far-right extremism 
needed to be sec- second in priority. Yeah, it's just there was too Islamic much focus, extremism. too much focus on it, and it was led by a man, uh, William Shawcross, who himself had made controversial comments about mm. Muslims. It was a highly controversial uh, appointment as well. I think the, I think it's a really interesting point you make, uh, Hardy. It, I think the kind of optimistic reading of what happens next is that this kind of delegitimizes what we're seeing at the moment, delegitimizes Islamophobic rhetoric and all of that kind of stuff about invasions, about asylum seekers. Um, I'm so slightly sceptical that that's actually what we're going to see because as, as we saw from 2011, memories can be very short. Mm. Um, once once there's been some convictions, once the bad apples have been sort of booted off, um, then, then the kind of the sort of broader causes of, of how we got here, I think will be quickly forgotten mm. by, by people who's, who, who themselves have had a role in getting us into this position. Mm. And I, it, yeah. I was just saying, I think we need a sort of, um, we need an integration strategy for the right wing of <laughs> this, <laughs> this country, the far right. Um, but I was just going to say as well, I mean, you know, one of the things looking at some of the, some of the coverage, particularly ch- uh, channels like GB news and mm. talk TV in the past couple of weeks, um, you know, often they've seemed far more angered at um, these rioters being called far right or their supporters being called far right than they have at the actual violence being mm. unleashed on our streets. I mean, I literally uh, I was trawling through some GB News stuff today and there are dozens of articles on their website slamming, um, you know, people being called far right over these riots. Um, and I think it probably pales in comparison to... Um, uh, sorry, I think you know c- c- condemnation of the of the riots probably pales in comparison. And, and actually, beyond that, they're actually blaming. If you watch GB News, one of the sort of main arguments is that the reason we're having these these riots, the reason these riots have gone on so long, is because Keir Starmer has labelled them far right. Mm. <laughs> this is a backlash against supposedly about against the comment made by which, uh, well, actually, m- actually misrepresenting what Keir Starmer said. Mm. I mean, there was a segment on GB News um, earlier this week in which they were complaining that the government no longer speaks to them. Um, and in the same sentence, they were saying, oh, but Keir Starmer, in his statement, said that anyone who's concerned about immigration is far right. Well, Keir Starmer never said that. Mm. So they are spreading this mis- misinformation and trying to put the blame on the, the people who've literally just come into government and actually sort of trying to clear up the mess that has been left by the, the previous government. Because, yeah. I mean, this is, this is one of the worst inheritances that the government has has taken on from, from their predecessors, mm. along with everything else that's, that's And it is really on. striking, as you say, Adam, that, you know, in terms of senior Conservative politicians, I think 121 Tory MPs remain in Parliament. There hasn't been any sort of very strong unequivocal condemnation of these riots as Islamophobic riots. I mean, Priti Patel, who's one of the leadership contenders, put out a statement condemning all the violence Mm. and, you know, quite strong in that sense, but didn't mention the Muslim communities being targeted. They've all been quite quiet about this. And and, and I guess the fear is, is that whichever candidate wins, they'll probably stand on a ticket of, for example, we should leave the European Convention on Human Rights and the rulings of its court. You know, how, to what extent are they not calling this out? Because they will rely on some of this to run their sort of leadership campaigns. I mean, because we can't forget that the, the, the candidates are whittled down by the parliamentary MPs. But then, of course, we come back to this problem, I would say, of the Conservative membership in the country then decides on who the leader becomes. And so you're talking about sort of, what, 175,000 people who are much more to the right of the country, Mm. even more so since the Boris Johnson era, who then Robert Jenrick or Priti Patel, whoever it is, will have feel they need to appeal to, with, I fear, some of this more conspiracist... And, sort of quite extreme and, and views. I, and I do think there is a massive problem of Islamophobia within the Conservative Party. I mean, there's been extensive polling of Conservative Party members showing that um, showing a majority of Conservative members have quite extreme views about uh, Islam and about and this British is the membership. Muslims. This is the this is the membership. And I've been at Conservative Party conference where they have held a panel. Um, who, which is essentially arguing against the existence of Islamophobia, not even debating where, how we should tackle it or, or how significant that issue, but saying that the, the word Islamophobia should not exist as, as a term. Mm-hmm. Um, but there has been no serious investigation of Islamophobia in the Conservative Party. It has been downplayed. People who have raised it, like Saeed Avazi, have been massively uh, sort of pushed to the margins 
of the of the party. Um, and I think unless they get to, to grips with, with that, we're, we're only going to see these problems increase. Uh, so the reason why, there's a reason why Robert Jemek is making the comments he, he is making about arresting Muslims for shouting mm. Alu Akbar or for saying Alu, uh, Alu Akbar. Mm. Um, but yeah, it does have implications for the next Conservative leadership. You, you mentioned Pret Priti Patel. She did put out that statement and she did criticise Nigel Farage for his comments about two-tier policing, not particularly strong uh, criticism but he she did criticize him but of course this is the same pretty patel who was filmed uh doing karaoke with uh, nigel farage at last year's conservative party conference and has, has described him as a as a friend um and he was the sort of guest of honor nigel farage at the last conservative party conference so this is a really deep problem in the conservative party that i think they're not even really identifying let alone starting to tackle mm. josiah it's Interesting in the, in the approach that the, the government has taken because Keir Starmer has been very, very clear in saying that these people are thugs, they're right-wing extremists, far right. But the word Islamophobia hasn't readily been used. I mean, do you think that is, uh, you know, a calculated strategy in some way that it would, I mean, does Starmer bank on the fact that it that would make it worse somehow to say that this is about Muslims and that would exacerbate the notion that um, the Muslim community are, are problematic in some people's eyes? Or do you actually think he doesn't want to mention it because he's also playing to a base of people that perhaps switched from Conservative back to mm -hmm. Labour just a few weeks ago and now has to manage that within you know, how he approaches the riots yeah i think there's a there's probably a couple of ways of looking at it i think one is maybe the reluctance to use what on the right is a contested term as, as adam said you know there is just a, a belief in some quarters that islamophobia you know it doesn't exist it's um instead 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 you know there are things like it should be called anti-muslim hatred for example and i think maybe some of that has seeped into labor party thinking i mean one of keir starmer's recent tweets um you know said attacks on Muslim communities are, um, are you know, he, he sort of he's yeah, named he, that as an issue. He has issue. mentioned, he has specifically um, identified Muslims as, as the kind of key exactly. victims of all of this, I think. So I, I don't know. I, th I think maybe there are there are just uh, debates over terminology on, on the Labour side at the moment um, that they don't want to get bogged down on, get bogged down in. Um, I mean, actually, on, on, on that, uh, you know, recent video from Keir Starmer which we did which did mention specifically anti anti-muslim hate um that was then met with a response from Elon Musk saying um you know well, why don't you care about all communities being mm. targeted mm. and of course then you go down this you know a, a mirror image basically of the black lives matter debate a few years ago which is you know all lives matter which you know completely papering over the fact that some some communities in this country are you know deliberately stigmatized are you know do face worse oppression than others so um uh, I think it's a bit of a quagmire, basically. But of course, Keir Starmer has got problems um, with his previous comments, you know, about Gaza and um, mm. comments he's made about Bangladeshis as well and uh, mm. during the election campaign. But I think... And the Ford report And the as Ford well, report as well. Hierarchies of racism within... The, so the, he does have issues within the Labour Party that he needs to resolve as well, even if I, I don't think it's, it's anything like on the same scale as, as we see in the Conservative Party. Mm. Mm. I thought there's quite an uncomfortable moment in, in recent days uh, in terms of the media coverage of this when we had Good Morning Britain, uh, which is presented by Ed Balls, so uh, a, a former Labour MP, former... Shadow, shadow uh, Chancellor. Former Shadow Chancellor and obviously the husband of Yvette Cooper, the current Home Secretary, who appeared on the show and he was interviewing her alongside Kate Garraway, which seemed absurd. I mean, it yeah, really, it really it's did. Yeah, it's ludicrous. I mean, I, I, yeah. I think... I think it was questionable enough him having that role when when Labour were in opposition. I think now they're in government for him to be sort of holding mm. the government to account, particularly his own wife to account. I mean, it's just ludicrous. I think if you call it out on GB News for hiring conservative exactly. politicians, you have to do exactly the same yeah. with us. Yeah. And so that was one point. But the Labour MP Zara Sultana was a guest that morning. And she was talking about this very point that we need to be using, she's a backbench Labour MP, very much, much seen on the, the Corbynite left wing of the party. And she was making the point, uh, I, and I think really forcefully through her experience as a, a Muslim woman of colour, 
saying, you know, it's really important the language we use around this and to to call it what it is. And Kate Garraway kept pushing her, like, why? Why do you want it to be called mm. Islamophobic and the Muslim communities are being targeted? And she was trying to answer the question, saying language is very important uh, because we need to know what's happening to these, to the, these communities in particular. And then essentially she got into... A discussion, which I think is the fault of Ed Balls, really, who was meant to be a presenter, an impartial presenter on this, and then immediately started a conversation with her about immigration generally and the Labour Party's approach to it. And she had, the MP then pointed out, well, he had written a Guardian article on this uh, previously, and Ed Balls said, well, I was completely right in that because if you don't, if you have mass immigration, you don't acknowledge people's legitimate concerns. This is what happens, and. Of course, Sara Sultana was was making a different argument, which was, well, those legitimate concerns are not actually legitimate because the the, the problems in people's lives are not caused by immigrants. I, I guess the reason I mentioned this was one I felt it was pretty appalling to see because it wasn't just Ed Balls and Kate Garraway. There were two other guests yes. as well, Ben Bradshaw and Andrew Pierce of the Daily Mail, who were, they were all sneering and talking over her. And I thought it was pretty appalling. The, the rest of the panel was sort of white journalists. Mm -hmm. She was the only one with any lived experience. But I wanted to talk a little bit about what I do think can become a difficult conversation at times around legitimate concerns, which in itself has now turned into quite a loaded phrase. But I guess what I mean by that is... There are a few, let, let's unpick a few of the different things going on. I mean, some of the people who are involved in these riots will have been driven by the great replacement theory. They'll be ex the extremist, far right extremists. There'll be a lot, there may be other people in, in watching on in the country who are not on the streets or just sitting at home or, or, or whatever, who would never do that, but might in their own heads think, well, you know, there, there is an issue. There are issues with immigration. We do need to do something about it. I guess what I'm trying to explore is how do we open up the conversation in a way that is genuinely constructive? Because it feels like any time, you know, those on the hard right say, well, these people, you can't just label them far right and racist. They have concerns, legitimate concerns. And then potentially you get the far left who say, well, saying they have legitimate concerns in itself is just racist because they can't, they cannot have legitimate concerns. They're just racist. How do we start to look at that? Which is really complex because I guess my starting point, arguably, would be as as I've discussed with you both before. You know, difference co uh, in coexistence is always difficult. It's always difficult. That's not to say we shouldn't be condemning and bringing to justice the people who are on the streets doing what they're doing, which is never, ever acceptable. But I fear that these moments sometimes in elevate the kind of black and white approach and the, the sort of hard and fast approach that's taken to these issues as a whole. Because yeah. actually what, what, we sh you know, what we should be talking about, I think, is multicultural Britain is on the whole a success, not because the majority of people are not racist in any way, but because despite difference being a different, difficult thing in human coexistence, we still have, on the whole, a, a, gr a great society that's harmonious. Yes. No, I think that's, that's I think that, I, that's all excellent. I, I would, I, th I think sometimes the difficulty with talking about these things is that uh, talking about legitimate concerns is just a way to not talk about what's actually happening on the streets. So you see that with when Nigel Farage, when he's interviewed about this, uh, he doesn't want to talk about the fact that, that people who share his essential politics and are followers and fans of his are going out on the street and throwing bricks at mosques. So what does he talk about? He talks about people's legitimate concerns and about how the left and Labour Party are ignoring those legitimate concerns. So I do... I, I think all of these are really important questions, and I don't think that the, the, we should deal with the we should ignore the causes of, of, of why people feel disenfranchised and why they're in a position where they are, are going out and doing things that perhaps they don't even uh, really agree with or don't understand. Mm, but mm. they're full, they're full, they're full. I think these are all. I think we have to divorce that from this moment mm. where we have actual racist riots taking place on the streets, and that needs to be dealt with and and have give no ground to, to saying that this is acceptable in any in any way these people need to be stopped regardless of whether they're somebody who understands the great replacement theory or not mm. if they're joining in on it they need to be clamped down they need to go to prison mm. and we need to be a zero tolerance approach because we can't have this taking place mm. on our streets then once that's over once the riots have stopped 
then we can talk about all of mm. these these other issues. But I really do think we have to kind of mm. um, kind of keep a kind of strict line between them. Yeah, and, you're and right, that. because they do just become conflated. And then I guess what I'm trying to say is these moments then heighten how black and white the whole conversation becomes. And all of these terms, uh, which are very loaded mm. and weaponized and politicized, are then thrown into the pot. And I, I'm not sure how much that helps anything. Yeah, and I think particularly with things like riots, which are, you know, they are by definition, like very extreme social moments that only involve, you know, um, a, a minority of a minority. Sometimes it's easy to forget that what actually drives some of the people to do what they're doing. And I think actually there is a big um, element of opportunism with these riots. You know, you see people going, going to them and actually we've already had some convictions of people who are going to these riots. And then they're also being charged and convicted with drug offences because they're taking baggies of cocaine with them and they're drinking tinnies on the journey. And they're basically seeing this as a, as a day out to cause disruption. So I think there is an element of opportunism as well. And I think it is important not to lump everyone who holds views that are, pro, you know, that are anti-immigration with what is, a, a, as I say, a minority of a minority, um, saying that I, you know, I, do, I do agree with Adam that um, this, this idea of, you know, it's very, it's very easy and it makes a lot of sense for Nigel Farage to talk about um, so-called legitimate concerns when when it helps him avoid the the real issue of what's happening right now again i think you have to flip on it ahead if there yeah. were thousands of british muslims going out into the streets throwing bricks at churches going to tower blocks filled with white white christian people and trying to burn them down nobody would be talking about legitimate concerns that just would yeah. not be a conversation that mm. anybody would mm. be having and i think the fact that we are having that conversation in any way at the moment shows how there actually is this two-tier approach to the, these different forms mm. of extremism when we went into the general election campaign obviously labor had to set out its stall in terms of issues such as immigration because that's the issue that sits at the heart of this that is then weaponized and politicized and the great replacement theory comes out of that and this notion of a civil war uh, evolves from it how likely is it that labor is going to be able to have as you say once rights have stopped a perhaps deeper and more constructive and much more urgent conversation that is necessary about all of these issues we're talking about given that it the party did seem to in its manifesto and its whole approach uh, before the election, seemed to acknowledge that they would also try to be quite tough on yeah. immigration. Obviously, they scrapped the Rwanda scheme, but that's not to say that they're willing to have a different type of conversation about this issue. Yeah, it's going to be a really interesting one to watch. I mean, like you say, I think... I think Labour tried to take what you know is seen as like a blue Labour approach to this, just sort of being being tough on immigration but fair. Um, you, you know, we've heard a lot over the general election campaign of taking on the criminal gangs, uh, the people traffickers. Um, what ha what happens if if none of that actually makes a difference? What happens if we still see similar amounts of small, small boats coming coming over? What happens if overall immigration numbers don't massively change? Um, is the Labour Party going to be forced into taking a, a or is the Labour Party going to allow itself to, to take a, 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 a approach which is closer to to what the previous government did? I mean, we, we've already heard suggestions of of offshore processing um, from the Labour Party. Not have to distinguish that from from the Rwanda scheme. This is uh, it's not it's not about sending people away to other countries. It's about processing people before they come to the UK. Mm. But these kinds of debates. I think there's a question to be asked about to what extent what we're seeing over these few weeks will shape that debate and whether it will actually make it harder or easier for, for the Labour Party and for Keir Starmer to have the, to, to kind of examine these questions or whether it's just heightens the the, the emotion of of, of, the, of these issues. I mean, there's some, been some polling out this week showing that concern about immigration now is at the highest level. Um, that it's been since 2016, since, since the Brexit referendum, because mm. these kinds of events do put really raise the salience of, of an issue mm. which which previously had been going down quite significantly yeah. in people's concerns. But how striking is that? Because the general election was only on July the 4th and it did feel like a very different mm. tone. I mean, we all felt that it wasn't a surprise, the election result, and the response was somewhat muted. But there was a sense that... I don't know, Pete, the country felt like, wow, we've, we've really, really had enough of this chaos. We need to now go with something 
you know, a bit more sensible. Mm. But how quickly has, you know, uh, as yeah. you say, this issue of immigration, for example, been amped up again? And we know, we know from what we've just seen over 10 years that, you know, the media, the politicians, there is a sense that they create the agenda, which then has an impact on the politics. And mm. I mean, on 4th of July, it seemed on the 5th of July, it seemed a long way until the next election. And, and you know, these worries that if Labour doesn't deliver, that the far right is, is waiting in the wings. But, yeah, it I wasn't mean, waiting in the wings. It was, <laughs> it, was already, it, it was already on the stage. It was yeah. already on the stage. And I guess the, the speed with which we have, mm. that has been exposed, is, that, is, that, is, is concerning. But I think the, the upside is that things can change equally as fast as the other way. You know, I think we, we may well end up in a situation in a few weeks where it's not really been talked about. And that, that has downsides as well in terms of not addressing mm. um, real fundamental issues. But I think, you know, nothing makes a front page like fire and disorder. And that's what we've seen in, in you know, spades over the past week or so. Um, you know, as soon as as soon as that stops, you know, I'm sure the media will move on to something else. But yeah, um, yeah, let's wait. And, see. and I do, I do wonder how much of what we've seen is is kind of a backlash against the movement in the country, the border movement in the country, which is mm. towards a, mm. electing a centre left government to rejecting the politics of conservatism and for all the talk of the rise of reform. They only got a very small uh, percentage of the votes and a very small number of constituencies. Um, and I, but I do wonder whether this, what we're seeing on the street, is this kind of almost a deliberate reaction against that that sort mm. of broader movement in the opposite direction. Mm. Josiah, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, about the social media platforms, particularly X, formerly known as Twitter. Who Adam has rightly pointed out, Elon Musk is the chief, and he is now perhaps overstepping the mark. This is no longer a a town square for people to air their views and all be heard. He is the sheriff in town and he is directly replying to the prime minister, for example, and saying that there is civil disorder, civil war coming to Britain. Mm. I mean, there was an act that was a piece of legislation that was passed by the last Conservative government, which was supposedly to tackle online harms, the Online Safety Act. Is that in any way uh, useful when it comes to some of the things that people are now saying needs to happen in light of what we've seen play out in recent weeks? So, so this notion that the Southport killing, mm. it was disinformation on social media that spread like wildfire that the suspect was a Muslim uh, person. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, large parts of the online safety bill when it was going through that, that were looking at, you know, clamping down on, on things like harmful misinformation, fake news. Um, they were they were taken out by the Conservatives in the end on on supposed, you know, grounds that it, it would undermine free speech. Um, and I think maybe we're, we're seeing some of the, the results of that now. Um, I mean, there, there are parts of the Online Safety Act which I think could make a difference, but um, much of it hasn't actually come into force yet. It relies on Ofcom, the, the media regulator, um, introducing basically add on regulations um, and, and basically getting to grips with uh, matching up with the might of the social media giants effectively. Um, but it, it will have power to, to levy quite large fines when, when that is in place. I mean, it, it, in some ways, it's hard to think of a, a worse uh, boss at this time for the head of one of the biggest, you know, online public squares than, than Elon Musk. I mean, you know, he's broken the convention of so social media bosses in, in, endorsing quite an extreme political candidate, Donald Trump in the United States, um, completely gutted the staffing of uh, X's moderation teams. I mean, I, I put out a just a request uh, in the past couple of days saying, you know, has anyone actually seen any posts been removed for hate speech in recent <laughs> recent weeks? Uh, and almost the unanimous reply was that no, people are reporting quite extreme content and it's not being taken down. But then you, you had an account um, which was called White Dudes for Harris, um, backing Kamala Harris in the US, that was taken down on the grounds that it was a, it was a racist hate group. Um, so you see very political decisions like this being made by someone who is, in effect, a, a far right, um, you know, fundamentalist, effectively, uh, in Elon Musk. His views have m moved significantly to the extremes in recent years, and, and he is putting that to, I think, quite damaging use um, as head of X. And it is leading to this debate about whether news organisations should still be on Twitter. Mm. Um, there was sort of an interesting video by Lewis Goodall uh, 
um, of the news agents uh, podcast um, saying if X, as it's now known, was created today um, and had been around for, for, for a little while and was acting in the way that it is with a with an owner such as Musk, would news organisations touch it with a barge pool? And I think the, the answer is probably probably not. The difficulty is that it is the the number one platform for online news for so online news in social media in the world, and so it is it, news organisations are in a very difficult position. Do you abandon that town square and let the let, let it be completely dominated by the the hard and the, the far right, or do you actually engage engage with it and get your own messages? across there i think it's a really interesting question but it's a, i think it's a difficult one for and i think that's we're already starting to see people sort of move away from it but i think you know it's it's not a clear-cut answer to that really question mm. really we, we've been talking and reporting on byline times for a number of years now uh, as have other publications to be fair about big tech and the implications for democracy i mean to what extent is is this it just inevitable or do you both feel that this is now going in a direction that is that is more concerning than even we would have predicted i mean there was a lot of talk ahead of the general election about deep fakes and the role they could play uh, in the campaign it seemed to me you know that actually that wasn't as prominent as a feature mm. of what happened as we thought it might be but the note, the general concept of misinformation, disinformation, uh, really was. I mean, that wasn't necessarily just online. We saw a lot of these questionable leaflets uh, just saying completely misleading statements put out by the conservatives uh, that that were around. And obviously, there was a lot of social media is largely unregulated, so you can just say what you want. I mean, do you think this is is now moving in a direction which is becoming increasingly a more overt, serious threat to democracy, which goes beyond just deep fakes and that something deeper is perhaps going on? I think that places like Europe, um, the US, I would hope the UK as well are are increasingly alert to the fact that algorithms have such enormous sway over people's experiences online which let's face it is taking up you know a, a growing proportion of our lives um you know i think the eu is probably leading the way ahead of ahead of the uk on this uh, after brexit um but i do get the sense that um you know that the action will start to be taken on this and and there will be a bit of a reckoning um you know the the power of tech giants and and individuals individual billionaires like Elon Musk uh, and even Mark Zuckerberg at, at Meta. Um, you know, in the, in the US, we're seeing big uh, so-called antitrust cases being brought against some of these tech giants. Um, you know, basically saying that they are operating as as monopolies. Um, you know, there are moves to breaking up some of these, and I think you know what happens in the US with these mega court cases actually being pushed by um, by Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris, and I'm sure she will continue some of this um, if she's elected in November. Um, could could you know shift the dial a little bit on this? I mean, there's also a, a kind of market imperative here. Is I mean, the reason we're talking about X so much um, is because most of the other big social media platforms have moved away from from politics and from news. They're really down, dialing it down in, in their algorithms. You don't see anywhere near as much of it on Facebook and, and other platforms as you used to in the past. It's only because Musk is such a politically driven individual that he doesn't he almost doesn't care that he's losing lots of money on advertising. Mm. Um, but and, and why have the other organisations dialed it down? I mean, has there been some impact of Facebook and the, the sort of investigations for, around it well, part, partly, in the US? Part, yes, partly those investigations, but also, but mostly, I think, because advertisers don't want their products next to any of this kind of content. Hmm. That most most social media platforms don't want to be advertising next to people putting extreme anti-Muslim content or um, mm. racist content. It, it, it's bad for business it's, and it's bad for Facebook's business. Um, so that's why they've moved away from it. But of course, Musk is a very different individual and he seems to be, this seems to be more of a political enterprise than a, well, it certainly much seems to be much more of a political enterprise than an economic one because he seems to have lost a, a huge amount of money. Um, in mass, he, he bought it a massively over uh, rated the price and he seems to have lost a huge amount since then um but the, the question then is what do 
what do you do about that? What do and I think yeah, Josiah's talked about fines that the EU is going to have some some powers in that regard as well. But I think that it is going to come down potentially to sort of greater coordination between um, different countries and different regions. The EU. Um, it'd be interesting to see what happens post election. Will would a, if 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 Harris wins? Would a Harris government want to to take on this as an issue we've seen them acting against tiktok in the u.s mm. would they take a similar approach to to twitter or, or x in the future as well mm. and just lastly before we move across to the atlantic what have we seen in terms of the sort of res- policy if you like response to the riots i mean obviously on one hand the arrests hundreds of arrests have been made and uh, those people now being processed through the courts in terms of the government's actions or announced actions, I mean, obviously the right's still happening, so perhaps it will wait until that has ceased in order to announce some some policies. But has, has anything concrete emerged as to what what will be done about this? I think there's been very little, actually, in terms of changes in policy. I think Keir Starmer's general approach, and not just on this issue but on other issues, is to, is to not want to pass too much legislation. So he said that um, he believes the um, the, the government or, or the police already have the powers that they they need to tackle this problem. It's just a, a case of the will and the resources to to get it get it done. So I I wouldn't expect too much in the way of sort of emergency legislation. I think had this happened under the previous government, we'd have seen a whole new wave of legislation, as we saw during you know the the anti protest laws that were forced through and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, I mean, maybe that will change uh, post riots, and maybe we'll see something. But I think at the moment, the government's line is that this isn't about changing the law. This is just about cracking down on violent thugs on the streets and get, getting them through the courts. And I think that makes sense, to be honest. I mean, it, it felt like almost a knee jerk reaction any time there was any mm. kind of protest or disorder under the last government. They'd say, "Right, we need a new law." Then, and they sort of try and fill in the mm. gaps of w- what. A, apparently they didn't do in the last mm. piece of anti-protest legislation. So I think it's a good instinct. You know, we have a plethora of laws on the statute book that can deal with violent disorder. I think it's interesting to see the debate shifting to some of this far-right violence being treated as terrorism, which I think would be, um, well, I mean, I think it would be quite fitting, be quite just desserts, considering, um, you know, that many of these activ- far-right activists think that terrorism is only something that can be committed by those with brown, brown skin. Um, but, you know, if it's political violence that's um, intended to... Uh, to to frighten, to to scare, um, to intimidate, and to and to change politics through violence, then I think that's absolutely legitimate. And, and I think we will see some cases uh, charged under terrorism. I think there's always some indication mm. that's going to happen. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I saw one tweet, I think about a week ago, of somebody saying, "Just want just a reminder as all of this is happening, and people are going to now be arrested and potentially be sentenced to prison time that we currently have." Uh, just stop oil protesters who were sentenced to prison. I mean, I mean, we certainly saw that in the last government, didn't we? This actual, actually, this attempt to prioritise and put more attention on environmental groups, uh, people, you know, doing protests in support of of what's the Palestinians, for example. And we even had recommendations from Lord Walney, who was the domestic extremism. Is the is the domestic extremism advisor to the government? He published a report which didn't really focus on far right or right wing extremism, but again looked at those particular groups and said that they were the they were the problem. They they were conducting domestic terrorism, which puts a lie to this idea of a two tier criminal justice system. The fact that we've got just stop oil protesters going to prison for for many years on the back of having a Zoom meeting. You know, this this is not a two. This is not a system that is is stacked in the favour of people on the left at mm. all. Mm. There's no evidence of that. So we should go across the Atlantic. I think we touched on it, Josiah. What do you think? We, you and I, were sitting here, weren't we, in a podcast which uh, with Peter Dukes maybe three weeks ago, and I was extremely pessimistic and said, "Well, it's another Trump presidency coming down the track." You actually, I remember you said, "Well, things can change very quickly, but are things going to change? How do, how do you feel and now about the situation? We have Kamala Harris, who is the Democratic nominee, and she has just announced Tim Waltz, uh, the governor of Minnesota, as her running mate. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a remarkable change for the Democrats in a very short space of time. I think it's just over two weeks since um, since Biden announced he was he was stepping aside. Just two weeks it feels like a lifetime, <laughs> obviously. Um, but here we are, and and you know, Harris does seem to be climbing in the polls. Um, I think. Trump and and JD, his uh, vice president pick JD Vance couldn't really have had a worse couple of weeks and almost every attack that they try and land on Harris and and no doubt now Waltz just seems to be falling flat. I mean Donald Trump has been going from calling her laughing Callum, uh, Kamala to lying Kamala, even deliberately mispronouncing her name or actually adding a B Kamabla. He's been calling her in tweets recently, just, just as a, it's complete word, word garbage, basically. Um, so I, I think that's really falling flat. And, you know, it's, it's striking just how organized the, the Harris campaign has been. They've moved incredibly quickly to, to get a vice president pick, um, you know, getting that done and dusted in, in basically two weeks. And, and they picked someone who I really think is probably the unity figure for vice president. Um, I think if, if, Tim Waltz hadn't have made comments about, um, you know, Republicans being weird, which is what sort of catapulted him to mm. prominence in the Democrat Par- Democratic Party over the past couple of weeks, then, then maybe we, would, we wouldn't be here. But I think he does seem like a very strong pick. He can, he can and I think probably will speak to uh, a different group of Americans or a wider range of Americans, those sort of, um, you know, white male or and, and many Midwestern voters that, um, that it's, it's seen that Kamala Harris... Uh, can't reach quite as easily so it, it's a it's a balanced ticket i think you call it yeah i mean I, I think we we did this podcast i think on the day that biden stood down mm. and we were discussing this and mm. i think i think at the time i said it looked like things were slipping away from biden i think some of the polls had trump ahead by sort of four or five points and i said that i believed it was going to be a close race with harris but that she had a fighting chance i think i've, I've sort of gone further now i actually think she's close to being the the favorite to winning now um she's ahead in the national polling by a couple of points on average um and she's starting to sort of nudge back in the in the sort of close state races as well as josiah says i think trump and jd vance seem to be ha- don't know how to deal with her mm. they're really struggling um the harris campaign harris waltz campaign now it seems to be incredibly well organized. The messaging they're putting out is really finely tuned. This weird attack, I think, is very it's very effective. effective it's yeah. effective. Um, there's a lot more enthusiasm, which I think we discussed at the time for for Harris. Um, and Trump's act just looks incredibly tired and, mm. and old. Um, mm. The kind of joke has got old. And I guess he's been he has been doing it, peddling yeah. it for a long time now, comparatively, yeah. hasn't he? Since 2016, and the electorate the electorate has changed. the The US electorate has changed since 2016. So, I think it's, it will be a close race still. And you know, I think it's I think the odds have it pretty much fifty fifty at the moment. Um, but I do think as we get closer towards the election, that those kind of advantages that harris has will start to show the only um sort of uh, proviso i'd say to that is there are some suggestions that the uh, the u.s economy might not might be about to turn mm. so th- so there are some fears that we could start to see some 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 bad numbers in the u.s economy and that could have an impact we, we've seen that um seen what's happened in our election where the economy has not been in a great state how how much of a swing there, there was mm. against the incumbent so if that trend does continue then that could could help trump over the line but as things stand if that if if things roughly stay as they are i think she she is probably she would be my favorite to, to win uh, in november mm. and it's hard to see who the trump vance ticket is reaching out to or appealing mm. to beyond mm. An increasingly marginalised, you know, uh, hardcore base of MAGA supporters. I mean, almost every time, you know, for example, JD Vance opens his mouth, he attacks a, a different demographic demographic of voters. You know, talking about childless cat ladies. I mean, um, you know, there's a very powerful uh, childless cat lady, Taylor Swift, who's uh, probably about to come out and and back the Harris <laughs> Waltz ticket and and many more. Um, you know, uh, Vance questioning. Um, yeah, you know, women who who don't have kids. I mean, I think you know. On the other hand, you've got you've got Waltz who proudly talks about um, him and his wife going through IVF and that being a very mm. you know emotive, uh, relatable human experience in a way that I, I just think Trump and Waltz 
really struggle. Uh, sorry, Trump and Waltz. Trump and Vance really struggle to to convey. It's a very humanized ticket, I think. The mm. the Harris uh, Waltz campaign now, um, and and it is one which I think does look far more normal, far more you know American, far broader than than Trump's increasingly extremist campaign. Yeah, and something that appeals to people in their own self-image because the president is the head of state of America, our equivalent to King Charles, who you know, hasn't really been on, on the stage at all this year, as have none of the royal family, really. But for them, it's their, it's their big symbolic figurehead. And you have Trump and Vance talking about increasingly sort of bizarre things about childless cat ladies. And you have Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz saying, well, that's just bizarre. These people are weird. Not They're not deplorables. They're not, and people who believe in them aren't, you know, beyond the pale. It's just all a bit weird. I mean, it really seems to be uh, an effective at attack in a way to just make people themselves think about what they really think about these people. Mm. And I, I often think American politics is so, it is ahead of the curve in a way. I mean, and to an extent it always has been because I'm, we're putting together the next print edition at the moment, the September uh, print newspaper, and we'll be featuring a feature article on this weird strategy. And I was just, as I was editing it today, I was thinking, like, how, where is that political thinking uh, here in, in the UK? What would be the equivalent as to how to deal with Farage and reform? And well, it's just well, interesting. It seems to be lacking to, to me. Well, well interesting. That, that, that I think there is some suggestion that the, the Starmer's win may, may be having some influence on the Democrat. Um, I mean, when, really? he, when, when, when he went over, he was apparent, there was apparently a lot of attention towards him there's a lot of interest in in meeting with him mm. and a lot of interest in in how he succeeded and how the Labour Party succeeded and it's interesting watching the first campaign event with Waltz and Harris there was a section in Waltz's speech where he talked about them being a government of service which is exactly the same language ah. that was that has been repeatedly used so I wonder whether that has been borrowed mm. sort of lifted directly That's so interesting isn't it but but again that really compares that really that's, makes that contrast between the kind of weirdness of Trump and their concerns of getting getting involved in people's sort of reproductive health and all the rest yeah. of it, and actually serving the people is all talking about people's benefits and and how the government can serve actually help people rather than Trump where it's just all about himself because all you hear from Trump is about himself and about how mm. everyone's trying to cheat him. You know, I was watching one of his recent rallies. Most of it was about how annoyed he was that they hadn't let enough people into the stadium and it was a conspiracy <laughs> against him that there were some empty seats on, uh, at the top, yeah. which you could barely see anyway. That's but, what he was yeah. talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's all about himself. Another part was uh, he was basically um, suggesting that Google should be shut down by Congress because uh, the Google CEO hadn't called him after the assassination mm. attempt against Trump. It's a very me, me, me campaign, isn't mm. it? There's also been some suggestion that Project 2025, which is spearheaded by this, again, questionable think tank, the Heritage Foundation, and that also seems to now be floundering somewhat. I mean, this is the 900-page document that has been produced for a second Trump presidency, which would fundamentally seek to alter the government uh, and executive of, of the US and include things like sacking hundreds and hundreds of civil servants, again, f limiting abortion rights further, uh, sweeping tax cuts and expanding the role of the president. And there has been a fair deal of publicity about this and how much that has been connect connected to Trump's campaign, which he, of course, has denied. And then there's another clip showing him standing with the people who are authors of it. But there's some suggestion that they've re they've clocked on that that's not favorable. Uh, yeah, with I mean, the public. Tr Trump is sort of rapidly trying to distance his campaign from the from from that document, um, which has actually angered a lot of people around him who were involved in drawing that up because he was of course sort of central to all of that and was was privately saying he was really behind it and now suddenly he's distancing mm -hmm. but again i think this shows what a kind of defensive campaign he's being forced into now because of the effective attacks that the democrats are launching against him i think there's a really interesting contrast in the policy platforms as well which is emerging actually the the policy platform 
that is emerging for, for Harris and Waltz is actually going to be very progressive. I mean, you know, they're talking about a big expansion in voter rights. Obviously, Harris has been a big um, campaigner on, on abortion rights. Defending that is going to mobilise a large part of the Democratic base. And actually, just in terms of what um, Tim Waltz has done in Minnesota in just a couple of years as governor, um, he's rolled out free school meals to children in the state. Um, big push on, on voter rights, rolling back some of the Republican efforts um, to, you know, what are effectively gerrymandering you know, tilting the balance in favour of Republicans. Um, so he's introduced things like automatic voter registration, which we're talking about now in, in the UK. Um, big, big pushes on, on the green agenda, you know, uh, investing in, in uh, I think he's put a 2040 target on moving to 100% renewables on the energy grid. So it's a, it's a progressive, you know, it's a genuinely, um, you'd call it liberal in, in the US um, ticket. But he, but in particular, what presents those ideas in a way which which is very... Uh, moderate and considered and isn't you know sort of rife with dogmatic keywords um so i think that's that's been quite clever yeah and the way he presents it i think is it, he, he doesn't sort of go into the sort of academic language like his argument for on abortion rights uh, during the speech was to say was you know our view in minnesota is you should mind your own business and i think you know that's just a mm. really effective mm. way of, of putting it rather than sort of talking about you know reproductive health and all the rest of it mm. and this notion of freedom which yeah. the harris campaign have, have put at the center of their messaging uh, we're not going back and that contrast to these two men vance and trump they want to turn the clock back to very weird times mm. uh and have very uh they, they almost the opposite of freedom. They want to uh, have more of a role in sort of your personal autonomy, uh, which I think has been quite. It, you know, there's a real contrast there as well, isn't it? And, and I think that was a persuasive part of the the case that Labour made at elections is, is to bring an end to the chaos. Yes, yeah. And it's kind of like a mirror image of that in the sense that they're saying don't return to the chaos of the mm. of the Trump era. Mm. You've got Harris, a prosecutor as well. Obviously, yeah. uh, yeah. Keir Starmer, mm. you know, former director of public prosecutions. There's a lot of echoes. Yeah, and it'd be interesting to see how that yeah, yeah. if if Harris does win, I think it'll probably be a, a, a very close relationship between uh, Harris administration and, and the Starmer administration. Mm. Um, despite everything we're seeing at, at the moment, it, it could be a, a very different era to, to what mm. people might have expected previously. Mm. And just as we finish up, has anyone been watching the Olympics? Anyone had it on in the background? <laughs> it used to be a big thing. It's not as as big anymore. Maybe, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm I think most, I think most normal it. people are watching it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had my zeitgeist No, we, we, don't, we, we, yeah. just, we don't have any, we don't, we don't have any bandwidth, I do like we? skateboarding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I should um, probably watch some more. No, I just remember as like growing up, it always used to be on a home and it just seemed like a bigger thing but maybe adam you're right it is a bigger thing for people who are not as um no i mean i've watched uh, a lot in the past i think and, and uh, 2012 i actually went to see yeah. a few events and it was i really mm. enjoyed it but yeah you're watching just... the uh, riot live streams instead no exactly <laughs> unfortunately that's been the case ah uh, well thank you to adam biankoff and josiah mortimer for joining me hardeep matharu on this episode of byline times live uh we'll be back again uh we want to keep doing these as regularly as we can and we really want to get you involved as well so we are going to start looking into uh how we can do a 15 minute q and a session with your questions which we can come through uh youtube because we would like to sort of talk to you directly as well we always like to hear what our supporters our readers and general members of the public think about these issues so we're not in a bubble as you know we're outside of the established press we're funded by our readers and without fear and favor we report on what the papers don't say so thanks very much for joining us have a great weekend and we'll be back here very soon <laughs>